So the name of our of my talk today is Bug or Feature. With dyslexia, we've really taken something that's a bug of the dyslexic mind, which are problems with reading and spelling, and confuse that for the feature, the main focus or main function of what the dyslexic mind is all about. What I'm going to try to convince you in the first part of the talk today is that uh, the reading and spelling problems that are associated with dyslexia and in most people's minds are the major feature of dyslexia. What it's all about are actually just a small part of what the dyslexic mind is all about. Research shows that dyslexic brains don't just work differently with regard to reading and spelling. Just about any function you can choose, any cognitive function, uh, anything that you can measure, you'll find that dyslexic individuals as a population will differ from non-dyslexic individuals. And that includes hearing, vision, motor, language, memory. In addition, there are advantages that we'll, that we'll talk about. So the idea that dyslexia is just a reading and spelling difference just does not hold from any level. There are really three basic levels that you can analyze uh, that help to illustrate uh, what the source of these differences might be and what the nature of the differences might be. They're brain level studies, uh, so physical studies of the brain, cognitive studies, uh, studies of the function of the brain, and incident studies, so studies of what dyslexic people do in real life, where they're educated, what kinds of professions they go into and what they do. So we analyzed those different levels and put them together, uh, what we found in our book, The Dyslexic Advantage. And I'm gonna give you just a very basic overview. So starting, uh, first of all, with brain studies. Dyslexic brains differ globally, not just locally. The differences become much more apparent the more non-dyslexic the person you compare the dyslexic person with. So in some ways, autistic people are at the opposite end of the cognitive spectrum from dyslexic people. The basic idea is that in dyslexic brains, the organization favors making distant connections. It favors one area of the brain locally sending out uh, uh, connections that go to diverse areas of the brain farther away in the brain physically, uh, whereas autistic brains tend to be more hyperwired locally. So they, uh, this hyperwiring uh, serves to uh, improve specialized functions. So uh, a lot of the savant type functions, you know, what day will, will uh, August 13th, uh, 2082 be? At the level of uh, cognitive studies, this first study was a study of dyslexia and 3D spatial talents, and they looked particularly at the ability to distinguish impossible figures. So this, the uh, researchers, researchers projected up these images uh, onto a screen and then had dyslexic and non-dyslexic subjects try to identify which ones could really exist in three-dimensional space and which ones were impossible. And dyslexic uh, people were significantly uh, faster uh, dyslexia and creativity, so whether you're looking at children or whether you're looking at adults, dyslexic individuals consistently perform better in tasks like multiple use tasks, uh, where for example, you're given a brick and, and asked how many things can you do with this brick. So those are cognitive studies. And now there've been a variety of incident studies too. One, one of the best was done here it's in Sweden in Uppsala, where they found that three times as many art and photography students were dyslexic as, uh, as individuals in the general population. At the Hull Engineering School in the UK, a similar type of study found that 26% of their entering class in engineering were dyslexic. Now putting together, again, these studies at these different levels and looking at them vertically, kind of from the top down, uh, Fernet and I tried to, to figure out um, how these lined up into different strength patterns. And we came up with this sort of heuristic pattern that we called the mind strengths. So the first uh, one was what we called material reasoning. And this is basically the ability to reason about position move, and movement of bodies in three-dimensional space or three-dimensional spatial reasoning inventors, architects, mechanics, people who work in construction, people who work in landscaping, all of these areas that require being able to move in three-dimensional space or imagine in three-dimensional space. 
The second mind strength we called interconnected reasoning. And we define that as the ability to detect, understand, and reason about connections, relationships, patterns, and systems, such as seeing the big picture among the details. High eye strength occupations, computer software designers, uh, natural scientists, uh, nurses, therapists, social scientists, innovators, trainers, actors, chefs, comedians. So people who can see a big complex uh, system and, and work within that system. Uh, narrative reasoning, the ability to reason by mentally reconstructing a connected series of mental scenes, largely consisting of cases and examples uh, built from fragments of past personal experience. Now, this sounds like a, a big mouthful, but what we're really doing is we're drawing a distinction here uh, between uh, two kinds of memory for factual uh, information in the brain. One is episodic or personal memory, that is memory for things that have happened to you. So these are direct experiences. The memory traces that you form of those have reference to time and place. So they, they carry uh, residue from the context that you learned them in. And often you remember them as cases or examples rather than as abstract uh, concepts. Semantic or impersonal memory, on the other hand, is just the opposite. It's abstract, it's stripped away, it's, it's just the facts. It's general and gen generic like a definition in a, in a dictionary. And it consists of rules and principles. Now, we found that, that for dyslexic people, thinking with episodic memory is, is often a tremendous strength. Uh, High-end strength occupations, of course, uh, occupations that involve telling stories, uh, but also occupations that involve helping people live through their past, reimagine their past, and tell themselves a new story. So psychologists, counselors, ministers, and finally dynamic reasoning, or the D strength. This is the ability to recombine fragments of past experience to simulate or predict the future or reconstruct the unwitnessed past. So this is basically almost like a combination of the I strength and the N strength. You're taking your past experience and then you're putting it into a system and then you're running that system forward or backward to see what an earlier state or what a later state of that system will be like. This is really based uh, largely on uh, the uh, the cognitive function of insight or intuition. Uh, it really works by processing whole patterns rather than by processing a series of rules or algorithms. High D-strength occupations, entrepreneurs, business owners, chief executives. So new approaches, new approaches to thinking about dyslexia. And I think the question we need to be asking is not what's wrong with the dyslexic brain, but what is, the, what is dyslexic cognition for? What are these brains really built to do. And we need to start thinking in a much more holistic way about dyslexia and approaching it realistically. We can't just suddenly jump onto the strength side and not recognize that given the systems we already have in place, we're, we've, we've created difficulties for dyslexic folks. But we have to think about the trade-offs that are involved in thinking differently uh, from, from a large percentage of the population. Now, how are all these differences currently viewed in our current educational context? My contention is that we've turned a difference into a disability because of our failure to understand that different people can be wired to do things in radically different ways, and that includes learning, the whole educational process. And as a result of the systems that we've organized, we've created some tremendous difficulties. And I'm gonna go over just a few uh, points of this to try to illustrate how, how we've, uh, we've turned difference into disability. But this was a survey that we did where we asked dyslexic people what was the age where they were first suspected of being dyslexic. And for the big majority, it was between kindergarten and second grade. So in the US, that means between the ages of five and about eight years old. How long did it take you to be identified as dyslexic? 45% of people in the United States, it took two or more years before anyone figured out that they were dyslexic. What happened during that time? Of the 80% who answered, nine out of 10 of those people uh, said that they experienced significant harm as a result of that delay. And what kind of harm did they experience academically? By far the most common, people identified with 
was that they fell two to three years behind in, in their studies of reading and spelling, and over a third fell uh, that far behind across the board in all subjects. In addition, a full quarter of the people that we surveyed said that they lost opportunities to engage in advanced studies, and one in 10 said that they were held back a full year in school. What emotional and psychological harms did these individuals experience? 87.5% uh, experienced uh, low self-esteem, Negative comments about self that parents observe, 75% school avoidance or expressions of school hatred, 60% anxiety, often having to be treated, 72%, depression, 30%, uh, bullying, 30%, loss of friends, peer avoidance, worsened relationships at home, all around 20%, and then some very severe problems with growth delay, eating disorders, physical harm, uh, delinquency, alcohol abuse, drug abuse. So these are things that we're producing in bright, excellent minds by misunderstanding and mistreating them. So uh, the rest of the talk, we want to describe some of the things that we've been doing uh, to try to help with the situations. And Fernet is going to come now and uh, share with you some of the things that we've been doing uh, with the nonprofit. Dyslexia Advantage has uh, established in 2012, and so we're in our seventh year. And on this positive message of dyslexia, we've quickly grown our membership to over 70,000. We're in over 70 countries. So, and also it increased the awareness of dyslexia associated with great ideas and ingenuity. All these things need to be discussed in the context of fostering um, the, the achievement and ability of, of all dyslexic people. So thank you again for this uh, wonderful opportunity to speak with you today mm -hmm. in this lovely country. Mm -hmm.